Hello, and thank you for joining us this week here on What's the Story. I'm here with uh, two of the members from the Always in Tune Creeper Lagoon. So, uh, guys, go ahead and uh, tell us your names and uh, what you do. Hey, I'm Jeffrey, and I play the bass. I'm Ian, and I sing and play guitar. All right, so you guys are right now uh, going out on tour. Well, actually, we're here in your uh, local San Francisco. But uh, you guys are out on tour right now in support of your uh, latest release for Nickelback, um, I Become Small and Go. So uh, how has this, um, this major touring uh, affected you guys' uh, social life? Or anything, and anything. How's the touring for you? I was just about to say that um, this is actually like a really weird time for an interview because we we're just finishing touring with Harvey Danger, and our minds are very shot right now, and we kind of hate each other, and you know, it's like very, uh, it's a very bad time, kind of, because everybody's been stuck in a van for weeks on end since May, actually, with not too many breaks. So if we seem like down or mean or nasty you know it's just <laughs> it's the road that does it to you and then now we're about to go out with archers of loaf starting sunday which is one day from today they are actually one of my favorite bands but yeah cool. the new record is amazing we're looking forward to it but so that's another couple weeks of hatred going on there it's just really <laughs> really really downs a person so but, but we're not complaining we're not complaining our, our lives are great this is a very fun occupation. You get to drink every night. So I know that you guys have put out a, um, a couple other records uh, kind of on your own or with some other people, with some other labels. So uh, how has uh, the, the deal with Nickelback uh, kind of put you guys out there? Because I know that they've put you on some really great tours, this tour and the Rocket from the Crypt tour. Yeah, it's, we've been touring since May. We were out with Verses as well it's been for a few weeks. And, uh, yeah, it's our booking agent's been keeping us real busy, and Nickelback's been... You know, the, the record has been making it onto commercial radio mm -hmm. in some major cities, and college radio has been playing it right along. So it's, you know, there are people out there that have the record and are showing up at the shows, which is great. We yeah. had our, our first single that we tried to put out on radio was a Wonderful Love, and it, it just didn't do anything at all, really. And now we're going to try another one, mm -hmm. and it probably won't do anything either. But our next record is going to come out on DreamWorks, and um, it will be more of a together band than we were because the first record was basically a, a compilation of a bunch of works that were done on four tracks that me and Sharky wrote here and there <laughs> and um, just kind of compiled with different players from different spaces and everything and, and so it really wasn't meant to do well or you know it was meant to get out there and you know we, we put all our, our all into it mm -hmm. but it wasn't meant to be this big breaking record that you know sells millions of copies or anything done just fine so far sold as much as we thought it was going to sell and you know, whatever the label wants to do with it from now on is, that's totally cool we look at it as building up a fan base right now mm -hmm. that's the most important thing is having people in every city that know the record know us and come out to see us it's working all right so how did you guys actually get hooked up with uh, Nickelback and then now i guess in turn uh, with dreamworks well yeah it's the story about Nickelback is uh we sent a demo tape down to this club in L.A., which was run or booked by the guy who runs Nickelback, mm -hmm. and he passed the tape along to the Dust Brothers. And the little story was that, you know, we called to follow up on the tape and said, you know, what's up with the show? And he said, hey, uh, actually, we'd like to put you on a record label. And at the time, we were just like, uh, yeah, record label. Actually, we just, you know, we want to get that show. Yeah. <laughs> and uh turned out that, it, you know, it was the Dust Brothers and... That kind of changed the whole scene a lot, and so that's how we initially got got hooked in with them. And uh, so, and so it's the record we worked. With the Dust Brothers remixed three songs on the record, and uh, we worked with them for a couple of weeks, and that was that was really cool. Okay, and so uh, what about uh, DreamWorks? What, how did you guys get them attracted? There was a, I guess Sharky had some tapes out in the in the in the world and one of the guys Sharky's the Dreamworks. guy who's not here yeah. he's not here so we're he actually started the band he released um, two tapes full length tapes and a single and the single was heard by a very cool guy named Luke Wood from um, DreamWorks and he stuck with us through good times and bad times and when it kind of time came to get signed to a major label we stuck with him because he was the most best guy ever, or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so the, the previous releases that you actually just mentioned, um, are those things that you can still go out and get right now, or, or is those pretty much gone? Order them 
you can find them. One of them's on a label, I believe, called Shrimper, yeah. and one's on a label called Slabco, the t two tapes. There's actually another tape that is out on a small, another small label called Cactus Gum, and it's called Death Sentence. Um, I don't know exactly how you go about getting that. You just got to be super indie and cool. Get on the web, man. But the, yeah. e the EP is out of print right now. Mm -hmm. You can still find a few copies. I, somebody just bought it from Amazon or one of those music places. Oh, the EP. Yeah. There's another. There's a five-song EP out mm -hmm. as well. But we're gonna reprint it, and it's gonna be out. We're gonna be selling it at shows, and uh, we'll be back out so there you soon. Have to come to our show to get. Yeah, we're gonna keep it special. All right. So I, I know that. Um, from what I listened to the record, I, I noticed that it's definitely got a first and second half on it. Um, is that something you guys actually set out to write, a first and second half of the record? Or, like, the first half is definitely more hard edge, uh, more radio friendly. The second half is, um, you know, the more intimate and thought out record, or thought out part of the record. I don't think we set out to write it that way, but when we were laying out the tracks, that's just how it worked out. Yeah, I guess mm -hmm. we, we were like, okay, what do I want to hear right when this record starts? Mm -hmm. Okay, what do we want to hear next? What do we want to hear next? And we just kept doing it. There was two different arrangements of the record before we actually thought of one. And one we like sat with it for a couple of weeks and just didn't wasn't right. So we mm -hmm. did it again the second time. And it worked to us. So. And part of that is the record, as I said earlier, it happened over about a year and a half, mm -hmm. and it was done in different studios. And then, so a lot of things have a lot of different feels. We work with different producers and different engineers. So it's also just a formula too. I mean, really, it's like you get somebody in the record, like Pow, and then like. You know, you put more maybe meaningful and songs that take a little bit more study to get into at the end. So you start listening to it, and eventually one day you'll just let it play, mm -hmm. you know, and then you'll get into these other songs. And, you know, it just kind of works that way, I think. All right, so my, my last question for you guys is um, a question that I've actually always wondered, and that is how do bands pick their infamous hidden tracks? Because I know that you guys have a, a hidden track on there. So how, what made you decide to make that a hidden track and um, make that in particular cut the hidden track? That was, um, that was a song that we wanted on the record, but just, as I said before, when you're doing, like, this will be the first song, this will be, like, it just didn't fit anywhere. Mm -hmm. It just didn't work. So it was like, damn, we really want this on the mm -hmm. track, but we can't fit it anywhere. So the old secret track. There's actually another secret track on the LP that's only on the LP. <laughs> That's vinyl for all you <laughs> that are don't know what LP means, and it's actually got a lock groove, so you have to pick up the needle and move it over to that track. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was my idea. I was very pleased with that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I just want to say thanks a lot to uh, the guys here from Creeper Lagoon. So uh, stick around for something from them coming up next year on What's the Story.